let's get going. Welcome everybody to number five in the Accelerator Blitz series. And today's session, really, really keen to hear this. This was, uh, you know, very much requested, uh, something that pretty much everybody in the business does every day, and that's negotiation. So we've got some um, tips and tactics from three of our best, and all three of them come from uh, slightly different uh, backgrounds within our business and therefore different um, client groups that they're uh, negotiating for or with. And so to start with, we have Nancy Manito uh, from Residential uh, in Victoria, been with us many, many years, um, one of our all-stars. And uh, Nancy is mainly with mums and dads, I think, really, uh, in the residential world, which um, we can call it private clients, but it's a little more uh, emotional uh, when it's your property. So that's a great perspective. Welcome, Nancy. Thanks, Liam. And we have uh, Jordan Schmidt from the investment services team in Adelaide. Um, Jordan is uh, heads up investment services for Adelaide. Uh, again, Adelaide market combination of um, you know instos, but a very big private client market. And so um, you know the people that he's negotiating with are both future uh, vendors of his as well as uh, current buyers, and then uh, and obviously you know the the repeat vendors who uh, are the high net worths in Adelaide that he needs to look after. So great perspective there. Welcome, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Liam. And then Tim Farley, who's uh, from our occupier services business, uh, particularly tenant advisory. Um, again, you know, very high performer over a long period of time, and Tim's um, highly experienced dealing with big corporates where property is not their main gain, but uh, also with the institutional owners uh, that he that he's, uh, you know, constantly on the other side of the table from. Um, and so it brings another perspective uh, from the, the the people that need to be dealt with there. So welcome, Tim. Thanks, Liam. So I thought we will we'll start with, um, we'll go through each of them one by one, but I'm going to ask each of you, starting with you, Nancy, um, what are your number one or what are your key tips and tricks or a piece of advice or approaches to negotiating? Yeah, sure. Well, look, the one thing about negotiation is that you really don't get the opportunity to ask an owner, would you have taken less? Or you don't get to ask a purchaser, would you have paid more? So in a sales negotiation, there are specific questions, I think, that you can really use to draw out, I guess, those intentions and uncover what, what is someone's limit. Um so I think really the best way to achieve this is asking lots and lots of questions. So, for example, you know, if that offer doesn't buy you the property, what would your next offer be? Um, or somebody, let's say, as a buyer, um, you may make an offer on a property that's worth 1.7, your offer is at 1.6, um, you know, going through and looking at other comparable sales, of course, and really knowing your market um, and just really honing in more on that perspective buy and say, well, this one sold for 1.69, that one sold for 1.7. Of course, you pick the properties that are most relevant, um, but, you know, based on those similar properties, um, you know, what would your offer be? Um, and always telling them, look, um, you know, you can ask the buyer that, I'm not going to tell you the owner is going to accept it, but, you know, they may accept less, but can you get to 1.7? Like just really honing in to see ultimately what they would pay. Um, I think what I've learned really is that an honest answer tends to be a quick answer. Um, so, for example, if someone says, oh, look, oh. we think about it, probably not, then you know, you probably go, well, there's maybe a little bit more in there and you're just really looking out for those subtle cues and paying attention um, to see if there's any hesitation of any sort, really. Yeah. And so a lot of it's done over the phone, I'm guessing, or do you also try Much and get people face-to-face? Much of it face -face? is over the phone. Yeah. yeah. And look, that's just because, I guess, in our market, um, everyone's time poor. You're really trying to work to a, um, you know, have things done quite efficiently time is the you know over the phone is the best way i think gone are the days of presenting written offers in the form of signed contract directly to a vendor and going back and forth mm. um but i think really at the end of the day something that's really obvious is that everyone needs to feel like they're winning so you know you have to make 
the vendor and the buyer feel like they're winning in order to bring that sale together. Um, that's probably the biggest key. And one I negotiated recently, um, the owner was at $5 million plus and the buyer was initially looking at 4.6. So we ended up closing the gap and it took some time and it was just edging away each time over probably the course of 14 days in the negotiation itself. And we ended up selling at 5.1 with um, three interested parties. But it was really just listening, repeating, mirroring um, with both sides as to, you know, where they were both at, but also keeping the other, all the parties informed. And really it's that communication that you're just, you know, that's ongoing with the buyer and the vendor. Um, because you do need to make it seem to both of them that it's tough, that's hard, um, as opposed to something that's like an easy breezy transaction because either side will think, well, you know, especially a vendor, they'll think, well, I sold it for too little if you make it seem too easy. Yeah. So you've got to really get that communication going and really create that sort of emotion um, that, you know, oh, look, they're really at it. Um, this is, you know, ultimately where they're at. Um, it needs to feel difficult. That's probably the other major takeaway, I think, um, when you're working on both sides. So you're giving them data to sort of uh, make them feel more confident in their decision or or to convince them that they are a little way away rather than just what you say you're showing? Yeah, definitely using comparable sales because you need to justify where, where things are at and mm. also creating that urgency as well. So if you don't have other offers, you do need to create the urgency. And in doing that, it's just all about your delivery. So like what I would do is ultimately go back to everyone else who's inquired on the property, who's looked at the property, insp inspected in particular, and give them the opportunity. Um, so, you know, and really telling that buyer who has made the offer that ultimately, you know, you do have to go back to everyone and they wouldn't like it, you know, if you sold it under their feet within five minutes, if yeah. if the same thing had happened on their end. So you've got to also use time a little bit to your advantage. Um, and also, you know, more importantly, like read the state of play as well, like see how buyers are responding to your questions and, and know how far you can, you can push them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one that I did recently, I mean, it was a $500,000 increase. Um, the vendor was between London and Spain. The buyer was in Hong Kong and two other interested parties. One was in Melbourne, one was interstate. And it was all just about making it come together. But lots and lots of communication with all the buyers and the vendor because they needed to know it was difficult and like a decision had to be made. It wasn't going to go, un, you know, undecided. Um, so I think, you know, we've all had that situation where we've had a fantastic offer, given mm. it to the vendor straight away. And the owners obviously thought, well, that's really good, um, but there, there must be more in it. And then you lose the buyer. So you've got to also just have it use your time into your advantage so everyone feels like there's a win-win um, mm. and nothing's left on the table, really. Yeah, yeah. So don't just present the offer without creating the competition alongside it to show yeah, how good that offer really creating is. creating that because in some instances there are, you know, there might be multiple offers and that's fantastic. Otherwise, you've got to create it and mm. go back to everyone else. And you may say, look, um, I've got, you know, I've got a buyer that only as of yesterday was edging on making an offer. Let me go back to them. So you're not really saying I've got an offer, but you're saying that there is high levels of interest as well because yeah. ultimately you've got to get them up. And I guess, um, you know, I'll, I'll push as much as I can, but um, I'll always tell a vendor on the other side that I'll never lose your buyer. So, um you know, you almost, it's a bit of a fine art. You, you push until people get almost a little bit cranky, but not nasty. Otherwise, you've lost them. So yeah. it's listening to their tonality, their, um, I guess, um, and sort of 
seeing when they're starting to become a bit despondent because then you know you've pushed them almost to their limit and then you can confidently go back to the vendor and say, I've gone through and this is really, this is where I feel they're at. Um, so it's just com continual communication. And in that, you're always building rapport with both parties. So mm. in that process itself, they know that you're working for both of them because you're continually communicating and you're building that rapport the whole way through. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, they're more likely to accept an outcome when they know it's been difficult and their understanding as well um, that you've sort of really guided them each step of the way. So cranky but not nasty is yeah. uh, is, a, is a nice way. <laughs> in, in, I mean, and in the best possible way. I mean, everyone oh, no. has their own method of doing that and their own way. Um, yeah. I definitely, you know, I'm not there to piss people off, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of push them to where I feel like they're at their limit. Um, yeah, good, good, yeah. good advice. I'll pull you up there. <laughs> we'll um, we'll we'll go across to Jordan now. Um, and Jordan, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things that are, are familiar there. But but from your own perspective, what are the what are the um, points that you take into negotiations that have served you well? Um, oh, well, there's there's a lot, but it's it's the best part of the job, Liam. I mean, this is what you you sign up for as a negotiations. Um, as much as I love the reporting and the budgets and the spreadsheets. Um, but this is this is your bread and butter. This is what you you sort of want to hone your skills. Um, and I think it was Peter and Ann Curvis in your previous blitz that sort of said managing your nerves when presenting is an art. And I think it's the same with negotiations. It's managing your nerves and being calm and professional. I think that sort of envelops everything else that we do and why we do it. So within that, though, I think it's um, communication, information, and then creative solutions and communication and information I don't think should be conflated uh, when we go into the negotiations. Um, certainly communication and alignment with your vendor right from the outset in the current market is is critical. Um, I think gone are the days where you see agents try and just um, underquote or get a position of leverage with their vendor and really then sort of shoot the lights out. You really need to be um, have great alignment. And in the SA market, we mentioned before that we deal with the privates and the high net worths and the mum and dads who have never sold something um, to the institutionals and the corporates who so it's a sort of an everyday thing and there's no emotion. So really having an alignment with your vendor is, is one thing. Um, and then communication, that then flows into the purchaser groups. Again, a lot of the groups that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis may not have gone through this process before. So that open line of communication throughout the entire process, whether it be an EOI or auction, and even just explaining that process very, very clearly and articulating what's going to happen, I think puts us in a different position to most other agents. And we hear it a lot in terms of, uh, there's a, that level of, I suppose, bringing down the wall and the barrier, and we get that extra level of trust from a purchaser. What that then helps us do is leverage that whether to Nancy's point, whether there's real or perceived tension in the marketplace or in the campaign, you can then lean on that to say, look, I told you about this at the start of the process. This is what you need to do if you want to put your best foot forward. So I think that communication piece right through um, and then that flows on. You know, there are times campaigns don't just close after six weeks, deal done, put a ribbon on it. Um, you know, these things can take 12 or 18 months through due diligence. And I think if you just close the file and think, oh, I'll just pick it up in 18 months when the, the due diligence is set to uh, be satisfied, you found you've lost control of the process. So I think regular communication and touch points with your vendor um, and your purchaser through that to find out what their pressure points are, how they've been tracking, do they need assistance? And then relaying that communication and that information to your client is really, really important. Um, and then, that sort of brings me to the different to where I was talking about um, information versus communication, um, and how sort of not to uh, conflate them, but we sort of call it information advantage or information asymmetry, which is delivering information to either party, and that could be your, your client to to um, exp explain what's happening within a deal, or to the purchaser, but also holding leverage and drip feeding certain bits of information rather than giving out all of the information and leaving yourself no leverage. Um, so that might be talking about, you know, you often get clients say, where are we in a campaign? Have you had, you know, good interest in any offers? And 
you might withhold the fact that there's someone champing at the bit trying to pay you a, a premium because if it's too early in a campaign and you give them that information, it's very hard to pull them back from that benchmark, even though an offer hasn't materialised. And similarly, on the purchaser side, um, not giving the information as to what your vendor's requirements are, if it's a motivated seller, if there's family affairs in the background, or if there's a, a bank involved that's putting pressure on them, but just giving only what's relevant and all the, the good bits to the to the purchasers rather than telling them, hey, I've got a desperate seller, they need to get out, their minimum price is X, um, and really giving all of that leverage across to, uh, to the purchasers. So I think on that communication piece, um, an example that I've got is probably um, we were dealing with a, a family that had owned a business and a property for close to 50 years, and they had a very, you know, they didn't want to sell. It was sort of they were coming to the end of their rope in terms of, you know, running the business, but at the same time there was a real legacy issue. Um, they had certain parameters, ideally, that they they didn't want to sell to certain groups that may demolish the asset. And then providing them with a communication over the journey of, well, this is what you can do, and, yep, you can absolutely do this and sell to certain groups, but you're limiting yourself within that transaction and you're not going to get the best outcome for your family. Um, so they, we had to really get them on board. That process took two and a half years um, to come to fruition, but it was a lot of gaining their trust. I mean, even acting for them as their agent, they still had, a, I suppose, a, a legacy distrust of, of agents of any sort, whether it's real estate agents, commercial, residential. So bridging that gap through communication and, and real information and honest information uh, was critical. Yeah. And then I suppose the last thing there is uh, creative solutions. Um, it's not as simple in this market now to just come up with... Um, run a campaign, get price of X, settlement in 60 days and, and off you go. So we're really focused on creative solutions whilst everyone's got their ideals of where they want to be, um, understanding through that communication, through purchaser and vendor, what's critical to either party has allowed us in a lot of instances to come up with solutions at the end of the campaign that will yield a better that. price for the client. Um, but also give the purchaser several wins along the way, whether that's timing for settlement, whether that's drip feeding staggered uh, payments for, for deposit or uh, non-refundables and those things, little wins that work for both parties um, and getting creative to get outcomes. They might not be perfect solutions to either party, um, but they're, uh, they're something that each, each party can swallow and, and, and stomach to say, okay, well, this is what I need to do to get the best result. And within that, I think the last thing for me is just understanding that dealing with these groups, whether they're instos or mum and dads, they're bringing you in as their advisor and the expert. So that's that point of staying calm, being professional and knowing that they've engaged you to give them that advice. So never be shy to demonstrate and hold firm as to why you're giving that advice and the benefits to each party. So just really staying strong in, in sort of your guidelines. Yeah, got it. So I think the common thing I hear between you is, you know, you're acting in both people's interest to either help them purchase the property or sell the property um, in your cases. Um, but you might not uh, always give them all the information all the time uh, because it wouldn't be in their best interests. Uh, because if you did, they might not end up purchasing or they might not end up selling because they don't know what they don't know. So a couple of... Uh, Quite a few commonalities there. Um, Tim, um, over into the corporate and insto world, um, tell us your negotiating tactics and tips. Yeah, well, first of all, I'll apologise for my one-armed glasses. I managed to break them right ahead of the uh, the call today, so uh, it just continues my theme of being weird. But, um, look, I think uh, on my side, I guess I'm fortunate enough to represent a lot of uh, of larger corporates um, and, and in doing so it means I'm dealing with a lot of the large institutional and, and private uh, landlords uh, on the other side of the fence. Um, in terms of negotiations and things, I, you know, of course, rents and incentives, the financial aspect of a deal is always important, uh, but it's also in my mind very one dimensional in terms of what we do for our clients and, and we've got to look a lot deeper than that. Um, otherwise, you know, People don't really remember what the deal was or what the circumstances were around the financials five years down the track, but they probably will remember whether a tenant has 
either stayed or gone to somewhere and they've actually had a you know made a good move uh, and one that's been good for the business uh, and and for the landlord been good for the landlord as well so I think um, the, the key for us we I mean we run a competitive process for our clients we you know most of the time we we put a brief out to market which you know for stay or go and and so that creates competition in itself um, but I think What's very important for us in our role for our clients is embracing a little bit of what you just said before, and we don't know what we don't know. Um, you know, I hate foregone conclusions. I don't like people making those foregone conclusions. That goes for both our clients and the market. Um, and you know, an example of that would have been, you know, representing Medibank, and you know, they they'd moved in as the anchor tenant to Seven Twenty Burke Street. Um, you know, it's an iconic building, you know, architecturally designed, won a lot of awards, um, featured in a lot of photos. And I, and I think a lot of groups, um, when we put out the brief for them, um, just expected that they were going to stay put, that, that we were just, uh, you know, shaking the tree to get the best financial result out of CBUS. Um, but behind that deal was a 30,000 square metre lease, just one single lease. Um, and a, a tenant that only occupied 20,000 of that, which meant there had to be a landlord to subtenants. Um, not a great lease structure. Um, you know, I know who's responsible for some of those lease structures and I think they're great because I can go and chase that client down in the future. Um, but it's, um, but it, just, it just shows that that in itself, that, that tenant's not going to exercise an option on 30,000 square metres when they're only using 20. Um, so there's a number of ways we can solve that. Um, through lease structure and other bits and pieces. Um, but also in that time frame, you know, a tenant of that size has probably entered the market five years ahead of time, takes, you know, 18 months to two years for their review process and formalising documents. Then it's probably two and a half to three years to build. So by the time you get to the end of a 10 year lease, the thinking at the start of it's 15 years old. And we see how much things change in terms of technology and other, other metrics um, and initiatives within the market. You know that it's a bit boring now, but the arms race in the end of trip facilities, as you know, wellness facilities, all of those things got um, fully electrified buildings and all these other things that need to be ticking the boxes for next generation uh, prime stock. So things shift, and so we've got to make sure that our clients are sort of across that, and 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 even shareholders now are holding um, you know businesses accountable to for their sustainability targets, etc. So we, we need to be in there being uh, proper advisors, and I think. Key to, for, for me, being successful in that respect is actually running through, um, making sure that uh, the market actually feels that they've got something to win. Um, so that's a landlord feeling that they've they've going to either that they need to win to retain their tenant, uh, but likewise the market that's trying to attract that tenant actually feels that they've got a le legitimate shot at at winning that tenant. Um, so we want them not just to win it, but to also recognise the benefits through negotiating with us that they can then, how, how do they make them sticky? How do they actually do a deal that not only wins them, but then might have them uh, be a likely stayer in future? And so it, it does mean that we do need to communicate well with um, all of the players in the market. So, you know, it, it means helping them and helping them helps our client. It's, this is what, this is where you're, scenario might not be ticking the boxes well enough um again financials i actually don't drive financials as much as people might accuse me of driving financials a bit hard on landlords um they take care of themselves if you're helping them through the process enough to stay in the race um then typically if they feel it's there to be won they'll probably throw their tom brady deal at the at the you know at the end of the negotiation to win it um a great example without sort of talking, you know, financial metrics, but Lendlease in the in the race for, for Medibank, they were the end winner uh, with Melbourne Quarter Tower, but but they were out of that competition three times during the process. Um, and ultimately, we helped them just address things like, um, you know, might have been terraces, might have been other bits and pieces, you know, um, you know, putting things in the base building contract for delivery that, that just made it better for, for Medibank. It just helped them tick a lot of physical elements of their proposal um, separate to the financials. The financials took care of themselves. Um, th th there were people that responded to that brief that just said, oh, you know, they're not really going to move, are they? Should we respond? No, I just, I, I laugh at that sort of approach. Um, and But but that said, we, we've got to be mindful that that could be the 
the um, how some landlords and, and agents, if, if they think that that's what we're doing, if they think we're just you know doing this to crunch crunch the sharpest financial deal to stay put, then we've already lost. So we have to engage with everyone, and we have to make sure that they actually are given a legitimate chance to yeah to win our clients. So I think the the difference perhaps uh, that you've brought to this is, or perhaps the emphasis, because everyone's covered off on this, is the non-financial elements, uh, the unmet needs, or sometimes the unspoken needs that you're able to pull out. Um, you know, Jordan talked about it before. There's a lot of things that you know both parties might not prefer to do, but they're little things. And if you explain to them, they do need to do it in order to get the outcome. You're saying that's that's where you focus most of your time. And then right at the end, the financials will work because it's a competitive process. Yeah, and it's and it's, it's sometimes actually demonstrating, you know, so if, if we look at, you know, during COVID and post COVID, there's, you know, there's a lot of businesses that have had um, underutilised offices. And so, um, and if we're representing a client that's, you know, doing a, you know, $100 million uh, deal or, or, or greater over the term of a lease, then board level that actually ticks that off needs to actually know confidently that well we've got a deal that actually covers all the angles and so um you know what we're dealing with a lot now is the the flexibility within leases so it might be you know rather than one big lease like i talked about for medibank before that might be five leases um that gives the tenant flexibility to you know contract during the afl period and, and actually during the lease as well um and understandably developers and landlords might say far out that's um you know <laughs> What, what are we banking on here? Um, you know, does this deal make sense? But but ultimately, in giving a, a tenant that flexibility uh, and that, um, you know, I guess reducing their risk, um, it, it means that you, you've got to have a little bit of an educated view on, um, you know, what's the likelihood of them staying? And I think in doing that, it, it, it means that you can give the board confidence to get that deal done. If no one's got confidence to do deals, then we're all stuffed. Um, so if you're giving them the confidence to actually sign off on the deal, and then ultimately, if they've got that flexibility in future, um, and we're probably talking about contraction, but we should also consider expansion rights and how those might come into play. And that might have been leveraging flexible workspace providers in the building. Um, again, a tenant and, and, their, and the board for that particular tenant have a lot more confidence in getting that deal done. But it seems like you're also bridging the gap uh, between the the uh, landlord and the tenant too in terms of trust. You know, if they're willing to do that kind of deal, then the the landlord's backing themselves to you know have a great product and to to be a good partner for um, your client in their future business too. And you're helping to bridge that. Yeah, we um, actually something separate to the negotiations, but I actually think it does help in the negotiations. Is that um, I'll often get requests from either leasing or sales to come and meet with some of the landlords and developers uh, out there to talk through the tenants and you know that, what are they thinking um, what should we be thinking about um, and and how's our best approach how do we actually you know engage with the market and and I um, yes it takes time out it's no revenue attached to it for me but I actually I, I actually enjoy doing it because I think it does build that rapport with the other side um, and again uh, my view is helping them actually helps my clients. So um, it's, it's a good thing to do. And in terms of that trust element of it, then I think they're more trusting uh, of, you know, just knowing they're going to get a fair go. They get, they're get they going to get an audience. Um, they may not win, but at least I know they've been given a, a fair shot at it. Yeah, and you're educating along the way. Well, look, we're coming towards time. Thank you very much to all three of you. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the kind of topic we could have gone for another 15 or 20 minutes and had Q&A. Um, that's not the format we're using, but, you know, I'm absolutely certain there's a lot of things that people have taken from today that they can use immediately um, out there. Um, and so thank you very much to all the presenters. Can we move on to next week? Because I just do want to let you know what we're doing next week, which is systems for new business creation. So we've got um, three of the absolute best uh, at that next week to talk us through how they do it. Three really different approaches. We've got uh, Chelsea Hickey from Office Leasing. We've got Hugh Gilbert from Industrial. And we've got um, the great Harry Bowie from Investment Sales, um, who have 
three totally different uh, approaches to this same issue. But uh, the key is to make sure the business rolls in, uh, you know, week after week, month after month. So uh, tune in for that next week. Thank you very much, every everyone, for attending, and uh, we'll see you then.